Special edition of PFTPM on this Tuesday, October 18. Joining us now, a man who has been the executive director of the NFL Players Association for 13 years. He is Demora Smith, another recovering lawyer just like me. 13 years, same timeline for me. Doesn't it fly even faster when you don't have to worry about practicing law? Um, well, I'm not sure anybody who sits in this job thinks that it flies by, um, but uh Let's just say for both of us uh, who, who got out of the business of billing hours, uh, it, it does go by a lot faster than breaking everything down into six minute increments. Um, not, not that that wasn't a good time. On a day like today, when the league owners are meeting, do your ears burn more than usual? Is it just like constantly all day long? You know that they're plotting something, they're <laughs> planning something, they're scheming against you in some way. Well, we, we affectionately refer to all of the owners' meetings as the collusion meeting. So um, we, we literally, we have for years. We just, we just put it on our calendar as the, uh, as the collusion meeting. I mean, look, I, I, I'm sure I'm the subject of some kind of conversation there. But, you know, Mike, you, you, can't, um, you can't last in this job thinking, um, you know, 24-7 about, about them. We just got done with team meetings. Uh, it was an election year for um for nfl player reps so there's a whole new group of of union meetings uh union leaders um obviously we've been working through a lot of issues um that that have been uh first and foremost um and um and it's just kind of that time of the year where we now transition to um sort of the meat of of the union business and what's ha happening internationally what's happening with other players uh, union. So it's, it's a busy time. Um, I don't get invited to the collusion meeting. So I, I you know, I, I, I would love to, um, and, and be there with a recorder, of course. This is an example of a situation in which I have questions I want to ask you, but the conversation organically leads us elsewhere. Speaking of collusion, this issue of fully guaranteed contracts, the Deshaun Watson situation sparked. Sure. We surprisingly had on the record comments from owners like Ravens owner Steve Bishotti, who clearly doesn't want to give his quarterback a fully guaranteed contract. When you hear that stuff, and it confirms your belief that there is some level of collusion because there's nothing that prevents any team or every team from doing fully guaranteed contracts. Is there something that effectively can be done to push back against this perception slash reality that they are colluding? Well, you know, sometimes Mike, and, and again, you know this as a, as a fellow lawyer, sometimes your, uh, <clears throat> your best evidence comes from uh, people who make um, comments that look like they're careless, but actually might be rooted in something factual. Uh, I'm being a little bit cagey, uh, but um, anytime we see what's been occurring in the market and we hear comments that validate those concerns, as you know from the past, we've, we've never shied away from exercising uh, both our legal rights and our collective bargaining rights to protect our players. Um, and, and people shouldn't be surprised um, if something happens in the near future. As it relates to collusion, specifically in reference to fully guaranteed contracts? In relation to any time we believe that the collective bargaining agreement is being violated. Um, and as a result of that, our players are being hurt. So um, again, I'm not gonna, um, I'm gonna be a little bit cagey about what, what, what we're thinking, but you know, whether it is on the health and safety paradigm or their obligation to avoid collusive um, activity um, or things that we feel that might be occurring that ultimately hurt our players' bargaining rights or their, their health and safety rights or the duties that are owed from the owners um, to, to the players, um, this is a union over over a number of years that hasn't shied away from pursuing every opportunity to protect our players. And and look, I, I get that that sometimes doesn't make me popular or the union popular. But man, if this was a popularity contest, I would have left this job a long time ago. You have my attention now and my interest because I know what's in the clause in the CBA. I know what the potential remedy, ultimate remedy is. And yep. I know you've got a contract that goes into the next decade. And if collusion can be proven, the CBA, in theory, goes away. 
in theory, it's it's one of the options. Um, but right now, the, what I'm focused on is anytime we believe that something that we've contractually agreed to is being violated willfully by the other side, that leads me to avail ourselves of any legal option that we might have. And, and you've seen it uh, before. We filed grievances. I mean, years ago, if you remember, it was waived gate. We realized that the league um, was hiding revenue from the players. Um, and we sued them for it. That ended up being hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that, that um, came to the player's side of the ledger. We've sued um, and pursued grievances both inside the CBA and outside the CBA for years. Um, you know, people sometimes ask why, you know, me, why, why the union sometimes takes such an aggressive position. We, we do so for two reasons. One, we have a naturally um, um, conflicting relationship with the league at all times. Yes, we do great things together, but they see the world one way, we see the world the other. The second, um, I do believe that when two parties agree to a contract, if one party violates those, um, those agreements, um, then we should pursue our rights. I mean, put it this way, when players are getting fined for knee pads and socks, under what world would we not avail ourselves of every legal option uh, to protect our players? And that's a great point because that's all the NFL is doing in that situation. They're taking advantage of their rights under the deal. You should be willing. The players should be willing to take advantage of theirs. Okay. Yep. I want to talk to you about the Tuatonga Bailoa situation yep. because there could have been a grievance at the end of the day over whether and to what extent the concussion protocol was properly applied to him on September 25. As I read the final joint statement that I can tell was carefully crafted and lawyers were involved, I feel like the league and the union agreed to disagree on the question of whether or not the protocol as it existed at the time was followed. The NFL reserves the right to say we did everything fine. My interpretation is the union's position is the protocol was not followed. Can you clarify for me and help make sure that anyone who's listening to this understands what the league's position, or not the league, but the union's position is on whether or not that protocol as it existed September 25 was followed? Sure. Um, and, and, and my great question, it's not so much whether we believe that the protocol was strictly followed as it existed back then or or even the changes that we've made to the protocol. For us and for me, the, the critical question was, was the protocol meaningfully followed? We never wanted to set up a program. And by the way, the league admitted to this. We never wanted to set up a program that is merely a check the box program, right? He looks at you, he asks you the questions, he goes through the protocol, everybody checks the boxes, and everybody can write down on a form that they checked A, B, C, D, E, and F, and then whatever the decision is made. Our concern was that given what we saw, and once we learned that both the UNC and the, um, and the team physician saw the play, did they engage in a meaningful evaluation of the player that was designed to do one thing, to make sure that the player's health and safety was the dominant issue when you made the decision on his return to play? And here is my concern. My concern is simply that when someone says that we ultimately made a decision to put him back in the game because we came to a conclusion that it was a back injury and they never examined his back, then I have a question about they, whether they meaningfully, sorry, my dog is losing oh, that's his good. Um, he's, he's not a vicious dog. He just sounds vicious. Um, <laughs> I got one of those. Trust perfect. me, if anybody ever tries to get in, uh, go ahead. Oh, no. She'll bark, but then she'll run. Oh yeah. No, no, no. And, and, and look for a treat. Um, yeah. But you know, when I want our doctors to treat our players as patients first, and I want them to treat our patients in the same way that they would treat patients in their own practice. And when we find out later on that they relied upon his statement and this, this injury that he had to his back earlier, 
But even after seeing everything that we saw, uh, that they never examined his back, what the players want, what the players need, what this union will demand is not just a check the box formula, but a meaningful, thoughtful examination where the player's health and safety as a patient is first. And so, yes, we made changes to the protocol uh, and they agreed to them. Um, yes, they made um, um, other admissions about um, that, that the protocol wasn't followed as intended and those things will be documented changes. But what we wanted to footstop in this whole thing is if you see a player in that level of extremists, we want every focus to be on the player's health and safety first, not how quickly they return into the game. And I think that this example has brought into focus the reality that the UNC, the UNC Unaffiliated Neurotrauma Consultant, needs to be the advocate for the player because the team has its doctor there, which there wouldn't be a need for a UNC if the team doctor could be trusted 100 out of 100 times to do what's right for the player. But who is the player's advocate there? Is it the UNC? Does someone else need to be there? Does the union need to have a rep in the room? Who protects the player, especially because we've seen the, the player sometimes need to be protected against himself? Look, the, 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 the protocol you know, in, in all honesty, the protocol was written with two things in mind, and you've, you've touched on both of them. We never want a situation where there is even a thought uh, that the team doctor is, is making a decision um, that, that isn't player focused. The second issue is we know that our guys want to play, right? So when we thought about the protocols and, and, and came up with these protocols, you know, two things. R remember, the league first didn't want to put the protocols into place. I mean, let's just go back in history. This wasn't the league's idea. This was the union's idea that they fought until the last minute. The person who's there to be the advocate for the, the player is the UNC. And, and let me just say this about the, 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 the community of the, the unaffiliated neurological consultants. They do a great job. And, and I will never second guess um, their medical judgment. Um, I think one of the things that shocked us so much about the last incident, you know, Mike, was what? It was an outlier. It seemed that we have come so far in this matrix to protect players that when we saw that happen, I, I literally, I believe everybody in America, uh, everybody who watched it was shocked. I think that's a testament to how well and how good this program has worked over the years, and, and particularly how important the role of the UNC has been in this, because at least based on our information today, we don't know of one circumstance where the team doctor has overruled the UNC's decision. Perfect. Um, when the system doesn't completely work, and we have concerns about whether or not Unks understand their roles, understand that they are not working for the league. They work for both the union and the league, that they're there to protect the players. Um, if we have a concern about whether an unk understands the role of the union in reviewing these things, that's when I think that we have a problem. And in this circumstance, that's why I made the decision that I made. The decision to terminate the unk who was involved in this, because as I interpret it, there was confusion or maybe obstinance as to who the unaffiliated neurotrauma consultant worked for. The league, the union, both, the UNC may have believed that he reported only to the league. Well, I, I in, in deference to that person, because I, look, once I, we make a, a decision like that, to me, it's there, there's nothing more to do. There's nothing more to drag anybody through it. Let me just say this. If someone is unclear about their role as an unk um, at this point, then they should not be an unk. If someone is unclear about the role of the union in reviewing the process, they shouldn't have that job. Um, and I know that there are a tremendous number of qualified people out there. Um, we are doing a review right now of, of all of the unks. Um, to make sure that um, we have the best people. 
we don't suffer from highly qualified people to be in these jobs. What I want every player to know is that we designed this system to protect them. And if something happens or someone says something that demonstrates um, that that might not be the case, that's somebody who shouldn't be working on behalf of the players of the National Football League. Was there a concern, and perhaps more accurately, is there now a concern in the aftermath of the Tua case that the league may have a role in sending this message to the unks that the league is in charge of them, not the union and the league together? Well, I think that through the course of us handling the, the unk, uh, I'm sorry, the situation that unfortunately happened to, 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 to the player and, and the aftermath, <clears throat> I think that when the league um, or their medical director makes a unilateral decision to meet with the unk separately from, um, from the union, um, that's, a, that's not only a problem, that's a breach of ethics. And thankfully, um, uh, Roger shut that down and that meeting didn't occur. Um, am I a little con concerned that the, the, the league's medical director, for some reason, thought that he could meet with the Unks on his own without the union? Yes. You know, perhaps it was a lapse in judgment. And my hope is that um, Alan's lapse in judgment is his last lapse in judgment. But, you know, again, if you think about the history of the way in which this union has tried to protect its players, we have been in situations where team doctors have lost their privileges um, in team cities, where a particular team doctor had um, DUI arrest and a particular team doctor was under investigation by the DEA for writing over 100 prescriptions to himself. And neither the league nor the team would fire him as the team doctor. I mean, I went through that. Um, and, and knowing that the league or the team could look at those objective facts um, where anyone could come to a conclusion that that person isn't probably the best person <laughs> to be a team doctor, and we, the union, have to be in a situation where we watch that person continue to be a team doctor. Now that we fast forward and we've written Article 39 um, in the way that it's written, that we credential doctors now, that we review their qualifications, we are never going to be in a situation again where we believe that there is some sort of divided loyalty. And, and here's the good news. Um, since that time, I cannot think of one instance, um, at least where it's been brought to our attention, where there has been a significant problem um, in the way in which um, medical services were, were, were delivered or provided to our players. And, and that's a great testament to the partnership between the league um, and the union. But when someone believes that they can take a neutral program like the UNCS, and you make a decision that you can hold a meeting with them by yourself, that's a problem. This has been excellent. I don't want to monopolize your time. I'd love to do this again at some point in the near future as developments warrant. But before I let you go, I understand that currently the union is in the process of searching for a new executive director. You have yeah. put in your years of service. You will be moving on to something else. And I can't help but ask you, are you planning to run for Senate at some point, given the fact <laughs> that you already have your badge ready to go? Over your well, the badge gives me authority, um, this one at least, to, to be the police <laughs> officer for every Super Bowl, because, of course, that's what it says on the badge, right? Um, no, it makes no sense. Um, no, I won't be running for Senate. I, uh, I am not a full-time law enforcement officer. Uh, I'm happy to have the honorary badge, but some things just mean honorary. Well, it's been an honor to speak to you today. And again, open right. invitation to talk at any point in time. All the best as you move forward to you and your family. And we look forward to talking to you again real soon. You too. Always appreciate you, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Dee. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.